All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I, I'm a bit confused because typically I'm invited to conferences where they do concrete shaming or they say stop construction and so on, and then I, I serve as a counterpoint. So typically I'm provocative by saying that I really believe that concrete can be, when done right, uh, a sustainable solution. But now we have already uh, heard so many love stories about concrete that I'm a bit uh, in a different context. But nonetheless, uh, as, as mentioned, I, I think I can add one aspect that perhaps is also of importance. We, we heard about this uh, a lot. I think we really need to be, uh, take our responsibility there and really act uh, as an industry. I, I expect I'm preaching to the choir. I like to um, start with this framework that I borrow from my co uh, colleague Catherine De Wolf at ETH. And what I like about this, this simplicity of this equation is that it shows that um, uh, what are the three main levers that you can use to reduce, to, uh, reduce the, the environmental impact, specifically the embodied emissions of a construction. So you see that this, this very kind of a simplistic dialogue of wood is good, concrete is bad, is an absurdity because this is only one of the three main levers that we, need, that we can control. The, indeed, the first one is to use better materials, right? And we heard a lot about innovations in, in using better materials, specifically here as cement, uh, uh, cementitious materials. The second one is actually just reducing the volume of materials that we need, and that's where structural design comes in, and also actually a bit more an active role of the, of the structural engineers in the project. And then last but not least, because the first two are the typical kind of levers, and that means that we calculate today and we see how much it is and we compare. But what is even more powerful is to extend the lifetime of a resource, a component, a building, and that is indeed uh, all these different circularity concepts. So I will show you how we approach this, and I really want to emphasize that I am I, not suggesting that this will be the solution for everything, but just to show uh, uh, that, that um, well, we need many solutions, but I, I hope you'll be uh, at least inspired by this one. So we use strength through geometry, we use material effectiveness and circular construction. So you already see that I'm not using material efficiency, which would be the more typical one, because if you build things that are light with a high impact material like carbon fiber, right, um, then you're offsetting everything, right? And so that's, that's the key thing here already that we have, we need to have a much more nuanced and transparent and honest discourse about, uh, about uh, sustainability indeed. So let's see what strength through geometry means first. I actually did my PhD at MIT. I wanted to do high-tech stuff, and then I, I ended up uh, developing methods to understand historic masonry structures, unreinforced structures, such as these beautiful fan vaults at King College. They span 13 meters, one three meters, with a structural thickness of only 10 centimeters. That's the stone thickness of these shells. So if you calculate this, this is proportionally as thin as, as, thin as an eggshell. So clearly, these structures have been standing for centuries, with a material that has no high-tech features, no reinforcements, and so on. So how was that possible? And if you then, I, I started already getting quite fascinating during my PhD to know that actually we, don't, we no longer know how to design those. It would be hard to find an engineer that, is, that feels comfortable to sign off on those, and so on. So that then drives really our research group. And we took the 2016 Venice Biennale invitation as an opportunity to make a statement, to hopefully shake our community a little bit. So what you're looking at is the armadillo vault. These are 399 pieces of cut stone that are held together because of their geometry. So no mortar, no glue, no reinforcement. So this is really equilibrium at play. This is the same principles that make Gothic cathedrals stand for centuries. So here you see our expert crew. I mean, this is not done by students, right? But uh, so this uh, 399 uh, piece of puzzle is put together, and I insisted not to use mortar, because otherwise everyone would say, yeah, but it's the glue, the mortar, that keeps everything together. So it's a dry assembled structure, and here again you see the contact is only 4 centimeters of main spans of 16 meters. So the first mes message that I want to say here, I care about reintroducing strength through geometry because I mean, it's a pavilion, it's a prototype, but I'll get to real things later. You see very clearly that you have an opportunity with right geometry to significantly reduce mass. So one of the three levers. 
Another project that I was fortunate to be part of, this is the Mapungubwe Interpretive Center, uh, finished in 2008, Peter Rich Architects, John Oxendorf, Michael Ramage. How did I come in? I actually did the safety assessment, so the equilibrium al analysis of these unreinforced uh, faults. Uh, we, uh, it was necessary to activate local resources, so both local materials, local, uh, 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 local labor, so here they are manually pressing, so without putting energy in. Uh, local soil, within this case, it depends on the type of soil, 7% of cement to stabilize it, to make it just strong enough as a structural material. What do I mean with uh, just strong enough? The, you see here that the women of the, the, women of the, of the local vin village are carrying the tiles in very small packages, and that is because these tiles are designed to only take two megapascals in compression, if you don't know what that means, that is 10 to 15 times less than our standard construction concrete in compression. But such a tile, you can just break it as easily as cold dark chocolate. So a very weak material. And look on the left, if you place actually where naturally the forces want to flow in compression, then this weak non-structural material indeed becomes totally safe and activated, like vernacular, like historic construction indeed. So the second uh, reason why I want to reintroduce, in, uh, reintroduce strength through geometry or good structural form is because you can overall reduce the stresses in the system. And why is that important? There is almost a one-to-one -one relationship between how polluting, emitting a material is and how strong it needs to be. Right? And so that these kind of right geometries allow us to activate low strength materials. And you will see many developments are actually rather on the low strength. So we brought all of this together in the, last, uh, in the context of the last Biennale in this uh, 3D printed bridge. I again wanted to provoke a bit because I think there is so much money being pumped into 3D printing and I think they're doing absolutely the wrong things with it. So what I wanted to show here or what we wanted to uh, 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 demonstrate is that if you listen to the material concrete and I consider concrete as an artificial stone, why do I say this? It's a material that is happy in compression and not happy in tension. So we wanted to show what you can achieve when you actually treat concrete as a masonry system, as a historic system. So this is a fully 3D printed, uh, uh, unreinforced concrete bridge. So masonry, that means you have to then also stick to the masonry logic. So global discretization, like a, a Roman arch, but also on the level of the elements. Every single print layer is aligned to be as orthogonal as possible to the global force flow in the structure. And so we kind of, through computational means, balance always in between these two logics. So we use state-of-the-art 3D printing that, as you can see, is not this rough 3D printing that we see big companies do, like very rough, like big, big things, very non-sexy. This is uh, nicely uh, non-parallel uh, non kind of 3D printing. Again, a necessity if you listen to how the material wants to be used. So what you then can achieve is you can really start to capitalize on, on, on these kind of new technologies. On the left, you see that we place material only where needed. We want structural depth, but we don't need to full mass, so we hollow it out in the middle. And on the right, exactly where needed, because this is a piece where the force flow kind of splits in two directions. Right? But why am I showing this example as well is because we are stuck also in a very sequential way of doing things. And what we managed here is that for this uh, 53 blocks of the bridge, in diagonal, it's 21 meter span. Um, this is supposedly more dramatic when this works. <laughs> Every single piece of this bridge was 3D printed in 84 hours total, right? And so this really allows you to push your development much, much further and then to literally hit print and bring it to the building site. And then we can assemble it uh, as a masonry system. Also, again, here we decided to assemble it fully dry. And the reason for this is that I also wanted to try to make a statement. Most people always focus indeed on reduction. That's the, that's the opportunity. But because we so, in a disciplined way, um, separate compression and tension, we can replace any element. So we don't have embedded reinforcement that can corrode after time and that can cause issues. We can actually, you could question why would you want to do this with a bridge, but you can as easily take it apart as you put it together, so you could move it to another uh, uh, place. 
Again, you will see later how all of this will make sense and come together. And then lastly, again, because of, and we heard about this, we, uh, uh, we don't mix materials. So we really have everything separate, and that gives us a super easy, low effort uh, recycling. That also means that we don't have a messy demolition. We have a clean, proper deconstruction, and then you can either reassemble uh, uh, or you can easily recycle. All right, so there it was. It was only there for a couple of months, um, and then we took it down. In fact, the city of Venice wanted it, but it was such an extreme prototype, and I didn't want to be liable for the rest of my life, so I uh, took, it, uh, took it off. Uh, no, that's one too far. Ah, you're clicking when I do this. Wow, that's impressive. Okay, <laughs> so I'm doing this, but the remote is over there. Yes. So. Um, also, you see here that we really used all these features that are a result of the fabrication to also show how this project was working indeed. So, but here again, to kind of uh, uh, look at this, you see this works because we have masonry on two levels, global discretization and also the alignment of the layers. And I emphasized a few aspects how you can really, and this is of course not using old construction, but this is a new design already anticipating the end of life, the next generation and things like that. Um, this is just an hint. I'm actually not supposed to show this, but anyway, uh, um, I think it's exciting because you could say, yeah, but these 3D-printed inks, they're super polluting. You're correct. That is why we are building now a 100-year design life. This is a real structure, a permanent structure that is, on, that is uh, almost finished uh, in, in Lyon that uses 100% recycled uh, uh, 3D-printed concrete. So that is rather exciting. That has never been done. And uh, that's why this bridge is called Phoenix. Uh, emerged from the ashes, and indeed it used uh, the resources of Striat as the first bridge. All right, this project is, is another one that I quickly want to highlight. It looks crazy, right? So this is not at all the Swiss box that you would expect. This is indeed built in Switzerland, so it's a bit, again, a provocation. People are curious, they go check it out. Um, quickly, because the roof looks crazy, uh, there what we did is we developed a reusable kit of parts that allows you to realize these, uh, these, these crazy concrete structures that are super efficient, that is why I care, uh, with just a cable net. So that is, that is all you need to support the wet concrete. Then we have uh, this fabric, and that allowed us then on this uh, flexible formwork then apply uh, the the very thin shell, so we are talking about only five centimeters of concrete here. But the reason that I show you this project is because for us it was a milestone. It was the first time that we could really show our floor, uh, our floor system, and that is where I will spend uh, the, the last um, 10 minutes uh, of my presentation. So here you see this floor plate. Uh, you can't see it because of the deformation a little bit, but you see maybe this gentle curve, right? So. Uh, but let's first uh, zoom out again. So um, I don't want to state things that all of you know, but we have a challenge. We, there will be many more people on this planet. We want to provide adequate housing infrastructure for these people. Um, I'll just also again use or misuse a calculation by Bill and Melinda Gates in 2019. They clarified what that means. If we want to bring all of these people up to an average standard, not our standard, but an average life standard, then we would be building one New York, the equivalent of one New York City every month for the next 40 years. So this is, this is mind-blowing and this is scary, particularly because of the impact of our industry. So let's, let's then actually look at the reality of this densification of urbanization. This is not my, my image of the future, but this is also a reality that we have to address. And I will, I will use it actually to share something with you that I found entirely mind-blowing. If you take any of these medium high-rises, ah, no, one back, sorry. One back, yeah. Then you see, actually, that the, the weight in this building, the mass in this building, that three-quarters of the mass of that structure is in, the, is in the structure. So that means that the structure is actually mainly there to keep itself up, not us, the users, not everything that matters. If you then zoom in a bit more, then you see that more than half of that structural mass is in the floors. And I just directly want to give you an intu intuition why that could be. Gravity comes down, columns are vertical. We have very efficient system to have bracing schemes, but I showed you forces naturally would want to form an arch, and then you have flat floor plates. That is why you have so much material 
inefficiency and intensity in these floor plates indeed. So another way to look at Bill and Melinda Gates calculation, and this you can find in many reports also of the UN, is that we will have to be building, or regardless what it is, but it's a big amount, 200 billion square meters of floor area in order to provide uh, for these needs. All right, so let's not quickly talk about material effectiveness, and I still want to address the gray elephant in the room a little bit, is that concrete is considered um, the most destructive material on planet Earth. I want to challenge this statement, and you probably already know where this is going, that you cannot just talk about the material, but it is where you use the material, how you use it, and, and, and. So remember the three levers that we looked at in the beginning. Again, I, may, I don't have to do this, and you can criticize that these are comparisons uh, of embodied energy per unit mass, but it doesn't matter. You can look at any of them, and you will see that actually even the bad concretes are not that bad at all. It's actually how we use concrete, how much concrete you use, and so on. Practically, all other materials are doing worse, and particularly also steel. Uh, a quick sidetrack, if I... Hmm. I'll say it nonetheless, isn't it crazy that 100% of the recycled steel goes into reinforcements, right? And so if we would not build like we do, then uh, we could use the steel where it really matters, where it's really needed, and so on. Again, use the material how it wants to be used and where it wants to be used. The same you can say with timber. Tim can, timber can be extremely good when you use timber appropriately. When you use timber in a high rise, it makes no sense. We can discuss about this later. Anyway, I'll stick to concrete. I told you I consider concrete as an artificial stone, so these are the geometries and languages that make sense. And indeed, if you do that, then you get this for free. This is not rocket science, this is not me, this is just statics, this is equilibrium, this is history also. So instead of forcing a material to be in a geometry that it doesn't want to be, from a structural point of view, you can actually reduce it to 70% less concrete and 90% less steel. You will see in the real project that we are doing now, you have to add a little bit of material if you need to have 90 or 120 minute fire rating. You need to add a little bit of material if you want to uh, be acoustically performant, but it's peanuts. So now uh, this simple sketch we then developed into the 3D system. So we have a vault that takes the self-weight and the stiffeners, take all the live loads in compression to the corners, and then you just have these tension ties that absorb uh, the, the, the forces. And so then we're back to this unit. It was the first time that we could show this, not in a prototype again, not in an African context where people seem not to have the connections or the re relevance for what we do here, but in a real project here, well, not here, in Switzerland. So here indeed, the structural thickness of our floor is three centimeter of unreinforced low strength concrete with 50% of recycled content already as both cement replacement and aggregate replacement. So this is how it looks. So this actually, uh, we talked about this earlier, prototypes, demonstrators, and so on. It's key. I, I totally underestimated this. As soon as this was built, it all started to happen. It's, it's, it's actually rather exciting, uh, the power indeed of doing something real. They will not believe you if you do it very convincingly in the lab, if you write papers about it, it's not going to happen. All right, let's go back to this, this, this situation. Let's take any of this building of 25 stories high, and let's, let's, let's look at a very boring kind of uh, design here. What happens if we would replace our standard reinforced concrete floor plates with the, the principle, the system that I just uh, introduced? So we will be using, of course, benefit, taking benefit that so much is in the floors. And then this, I already announced this, we need to reintroduce a little bit more material when we, when we hit the fire, uh, fire regulations. But you, you see, we still have two-thirds of concrete reduction and at least um, uh, uh, one-fifth uh, of the steel left. So for one building, you would save, so one of these, all these buildings, we would save 7,500 cubic meters. That's maybe a bit abstract, but that translates to 12, more than 1,200 concrete trucks that would not have to go to this building site. But also, additionally, per story, you would save, more than, uh, you would save about 20 kilometers of uh, number 12 um, uh, uh, steel rebar, which, 
coincidentally rolls out uh, from Zurich, where I happily live and work, to Brussels, where I'm very proudly from. But this is a lot of reinforcement, right? So you not only have more than 1,200 trucks, you also save this reinforcement. But I made this big statement, it's not about volumes. It really is not about volumes. But, no, one back, sorry. What really matters is, is the global warming potential, the embodied emissions, right? I know, yeah, thank you. And there we have to consider, so here we are ignoring the circularity opportunities for now. But so you have the volume, the mass of material, and the impact of that material that here we quantify as an embodied carbon coefficient. So clearly, structural geometry, remember the armadillo vault, we can significantly reduce the mass. We can use all the innovations or state-of-the-art kind of low-carbon concretes that are on the market. So I will stick to one that is on the market to do my, my, my numbers. But remember, I also said that we have another opportunity with good geometry, that is, reduce the stresses. So how does that look like for these floor plates? So you see that this is just the volume reduction on the left. Then, and this is quite interesting, right? Just by going for lower strength material, you get an additional bonus of 20%. And then, this is state of the art. You heard our colleagues, they can go entirely carbon neutral, so that would be even better. But you can go to, uh, uh, to for sure, today with a SEM3, you can go to a two-thirds reduction of the emissions. So that is what happens on the concrete. You add the effect of the steel. And then you see that today, what I presented, and again, what, what's nice about me is that um, this is just things that we have seen around us that have been standing for centuries. So this is what you can achieve when you actually listen to the material, how concrete wants to be treated as an artificial stone. Maybe one point that I want to make uh, is that, and we heard about this uh, earlier, if you only focus on the material, so this discourse like that, that material is what matters, yes, it matters, but then you can reduce, for example, to 50% 50, 50 reduction, but the mass stays the same. We have only 15%, so 85% reduction, but we have also one-third of the mass. And why is this important? Maybe I'll show you this with uh, the actual project that we're building now. I also wanted to make another uh, statement that because we reduce so much volume, if we use the most polluting concrete, then you see that actually that doesn't matter anymore. So this is a much bigger lever than playing on the material. Reducing the volume, getting the material right, is much more powerful. All right, so lastly, circular construction. Uh, we develop uh, what is called the Ripman floor system after our late colleague Matthias Ripman. And uh, that is where we are bringing everything together. So everything that I talked about in all these different references is now integrated in the system. So uh, I, we added one thing, it's prefabricated, so it's precise, fast, you can speed up construction, you can address this, this kind of productivity we heard about earlier. We use low-strength, low-carbon concrete. We do clean, super-disciplined material separation in everything so that you, can, you don't lose these, these circularity opportunities. It's dry assembled so that you can take it apart as easily as you assembled it. And then lastly, actually, this fully unreinforcedness really adds that, that durability. There's no embedded reinforcement that can cause issues. You don't have to add cover for fire regulations because there is no steel in it, and, and, and. Of course, we have to do due diligence. Many people do many kind of numbers. This is 100% following the Swiss guidelines, right? And you see that actually the Swiss guidelines no longer want to take the carbon sequestration in timber for highly engineered timbers with a lot of glue, a lot of steel that will be probably not used at the end of the lifetime. But regardless, because that's typically our competitor, right? Do you do better than timber? So let's take out all the rest there in the timber. You see that we still do significantly better, and you can challenge me on this, you can calculate it yourself. So we are always lower with our floor system. And again, I don't want to be kind of the concrete poster boy, but I want to say why this is happening is because we listen to the material. You would have the same efficiencies if you listen always carefully to your material. What we are doing, by the way, in our projects, the dark gray is the transport for prefab. And so our projects, we're setting up a prefabrication site very close to, uh, to the building site or next to a waterway and things like that. Um, I show you one of, I'm very proud to say that we have uh, four, four and a half, because one is in Hamburg, we won a big competition, and so yes, innovation, we're gonna first project in Germany. 
And then I was confronted with this din, this, and um, zonder, uh, whatever. So I'm not sure I want to do this uh, in, in our early stage here. I, it's, it seems like one too many challenges to convince kind of German authorities that this is a good idea. So, but anyway, I'm very proud of this one. We won this competition. It's in full swing. Uh, we are actually f uh, finalizing a full mock-up. Uh, my team is casting it right now. And so this is a 10-story building uh, competition we won with Gigon Guya in, in, in uh, Zug. And as you see, they nicely designed the, the project entirely around these floors, uh, floor plates. In this case, we have six and a half by six and a half meter spans. Um, uh, uh, so that is a nice manageable size. I told you that I was quickly going to come back here. So everyone, sorry, I'm running out of time because I had to squeeze from 30 into 20 and I'm, I'm already at 25, so shit, sorry. Um, but my slides were for exactly 30. Um, so where am I? Ah, why this is important. Everyone seems so, and I think Bill Gates there actually gave everyone an excuse to market sustainable solutions higher. Everyone says it's more expensive. It's true, like a sustainable concrete, because it's not the regular standard uh, 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 produced at mark. They, they are much more expensive. So what we managed to do and the reason that we are now really doing this project in Zug is because our system is so much lighter that we have less primary structure, so less columns, less foundations, and so on. And when you calculate the entire building, we offer all these sustain sustainability disruptions at the same cost, cost neutral for the client. In fact, why that is possible is we are marketing our project, uh, product to exactly be there. And I can give, maybe give you a little bit of an insight, is that we can market our floor at 250% the equivalent of your floor, and it still works out, right? So that is exciting. That means that we managed to have a way to not only introduce sustainability, but also to start to sell value and no longer volume, right? We need to get out of this. We need to go to performance. All right, we do this with our spin-off, uh, Vaulted. I'm very proud that we bootstrapped everything. We don't need external funding because we have all these projects paying for our development and so on. So this is a, uh, uh, an early prototype we made. Uh, it's, it's, it's nicely assembled. We have an entire crew to do that. And this is uh, this uh, six and a half by six and a half meter span with just a few centimeters of low strength concrete. In this case, it's C20 concrete. It's a SEM3. So this really hits all the, all the targets, all the marks that I said to you before. Uh, this was not on, done on purpose, but uh, this is part of the team. And you see that they nicely. Uh, be, when I took the fourth color, it was actually the German flag, but this is more appropriately the Belgian flag, indeed. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> All right, so why I so passionately talk about this is because, again, look at this image. Imagine 40% of the material of all of these buildings is in the floors, right? So, um, sorry. And then one more statement that I want to make, why I work on concrete, the evil material, is because I want to scale up and have impact. Concrete is available everywhere, and I'm still showing these sustainability benefits. This is a collaboration with my colleague Benjamin Dillenberger. It's a 3D printed uh, waste dust from marble quarries and so on. It's using a geopolymer. So just to say that any material that is happy in compression could be translated. But why we are not doing this today is imagine what's going to happen if you say, we use an unreinforced floor, it's a new system, it's, uh, it has complex geometry, we use a material you have never used, it's never going to happen. That's why I want to have impact, and that's also why I'm realistic and not idealist, uh, idealistic. I idealistic. All right, so I talked about structural geometry to reduce mass, the right geometry to reduce the stresses and enhance the impact of the material. You saw in tangent that digital fabrication allows us actually to, without additional waste, realize these non-standard structural geometries at cost economically. And then I try to argue that if you consider unreinforced concrete as a, as a discrete masonry system, then you have a lot of circularity opportunities. And I didn't touch on the last point, but that is essential, right? If you just swap an innovation, that's not going to happen. You need to also find ways to integrate and to work together with all the different stakeholders in construction, and that is where we innovate in computational methods. So uh, this, this is the end. By the way, in the middle, this is our late, late colleague, Matthias Rippmann, who sadly passed away, and we are dedicating the name of this floor system to him. Uh, now, that's actually a bit of a sad note to end with, but uh, um, yeah, there you go. Thank you.